Okay. So Daniel, you. I'm going to um, let you or ask you uh -huh. to introduce yourself and just give a little quick quick okay. summary about your history and and um, and then let you get started. Okay. Um, let me just change this view again. There we go. Right. Um, well, thank you everybody for making time for um, this webinar. And um, yeah, who am I? <laughs> uh, I have been, well, basically I started off as a biologist and um, was studying marine mammals and at some point realized that if I continued to study marine mammals, my grandchildren would probably only um, know of them from picture books because they would go extinct. And so I decided to um, pay attention to my own species, uh, but mainly because I like marine mammals. Um, and um, that then took me to studying at Schumacher College, doing a master's in holistic science, and later a PhD in design for sustainability, um, or it was called Design for Human and Planetary Health, a holistic integral approach to complexity and sustainability, like a good PhD should have a big chunky name. And it was also a 750 page thesis that nobody wanted to read. And that was in 2006. And um, since then, I've been trying to explore what all that thinking and all that research that I did for my PhD and for my master's um, would actually look like in practice. So I've spent some time working with the Ecovillage movement, um, lived at the Findhorn Ecovillage, ran Findhorn College to build bridges between universities and uh, Ecovillages as applied field study sites for, for applied sustainability and um, worked with pioneers, brought pioneers to Europe, and got invited to join the International Futures Forum, which is a group of mainly, at the time it was mainly older consultants who'd already had their career and really wanted to share the tools of their career uh, with the world. And they sort of realized that they needed to bring in some fresh thinking and some, some younger ones, and um, I was lucky enough to be part of that. And um, yeah, so basically in 2016, I published a book, which I think I've got lying here, yeah, Designing Regenerative Cultures. And since then, I've started to work with social media and putting my writing online, and not, not just my book, but also, um, also the earlier writing. And, and really, that's been the work that has uh, created a visibility that, that now people are interested in um, having conversations with me. They could have had them 10 years earlier, but unfortunately I didn't share the information. So um, I'm really glad to um, have this webinar because it's another opportunity to share some um, thinking with you. And um, I would like to highlight from the begin, uh, from the start that I'm, I'm gonna talk for about four to five minutes and really, I would love your feedback on this. This is work in progress. This is not uh, the gospel and you don't need to believe it. I'm, I'm just talking about what, what I'm thinking about this issue. And then I would love to hear your experience because I know that um, Diana has a link to the International Society of System Science. And um, so I'm sure that some of the people on the call will, will be more expert in all this than I am. So let me just... Uh, try again whether I can do the screen share properly. Uh, it should be this one and here. And then I go and Just to remind everybody and those that joined, um, be sure and put in the chat where you're from and any references you want to share with us about your work. Um, and then any questions you might have for Daniel, um, you can put in there as well. Um, I'm trying to get rid of this little window here. I think you're, you're good. Can you, can you not see the window of all the people? Oops. I can see it just on mine. Okay. Um, good. Well, let's get started. Um, I also have to say that because I this morning I thought, no, I don't want to use a presentation that I've used before. Um, and so I've been building this presentation frantically all day between taking care of my 20-month-old daughter. And um, I haven't quite finished. So it, it's, it's good enough. Um, so I, I like to start by repeating that 
anything that is said is said by an observer, as Humberto Maturana po pointed yeah. out. Um, and therefore, every observation has a blind spot. Um, but I also want to point out, which is what I learned from one of my mentors at Schumacher College, Brian Goodwin, that really you can't be an observer. You're always a participant. You're always um, subjectively involved in the system you're dealing with. And really with the title of moving into systems practice, I think that is at the core of what I'm trying to explore today. What, what it means to be humble as a systems practitioner, to understand that um, there are multiple ways of knowing and they all can inform how we participate in a system. And that we all really are both the results of this emergent complex dynamic system in which we participate, we're, we're sort of the emergent properties. But we also, if, if you all mute your mic, then we won't have the, the noise in the background. But we're also basically uh, all co-creative participants of the system, which means that everything we do every day, all the time, shapes the future of the world. And for me, that is really crucial at this point where um, we are facing, as Jem Bendel calls it, a near-term human extinction. Uh, the possibility that if we don't make more appropriate choices about how, about how to participate in the biosphere as a complex dynamic system, um, that we might not be around in the 20, uh, 22nd century, or only very few of us, is, is real and present. And we have young children going into the streets and um, telling the world leaders uh, it's time to act upon this. So um, while a lot of what I will talk about today might seem at a higher level of kind of um, theory, I, I think that's another false dualism that we often work with, the dualism between theory and practice. The, the meta design that did, that changes worldviews and value system is really the upstream end of the crisis that that we face. And so, if you if you change worldviews and value systems, you change everything downstream. And um, but but all this theoretical framework that we'll explore today is really in the context of a very practical and urgent crisis on the planet of how do we respond to climate change? How do we respond to these converging crises that that we're facing? And um, basically, for me, learning from Brian Goodwin at Schumacher College, the, the, the key insight that I got from Brian was that science was now at a point where it was understanding that we, um, that we cannot predict and control a system beyond the very limited boundary of, of a system. And that because we're always participants, the, the whole aim of science had to shift from increased manipulation, increased control and prediction, which is really the agenda of the scientific activity since the scientific revolution, to understanding our role within this complex dynamic system and how to participate appropriately. And that in that is a shift from a science of that is mainly caring about quantities and the measurable to a science of qualities that um, shouldn't fall necessarily into the, um, the, 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 the trap of trying to measure, quantit uh, measure qualities. Because the minute you, you try to quantify qualities, you lose something that is really important. And um, so, Another person who is very much linked with the um, IS and, and the world of systems thinking is Donella Meadows. And in this movement that we're in of uh, people wanting to change the world for a better future, there's a lot of talk about paradigm shifting. And I really like pointing out that there are two versions of Donella Meadows' famous article, uh, on leverage points, places to intervene with a, with a system. The first version, I like to call Donella Meadows 1.0, where she was still very much um, that kind of modeling system scientist trying to just, as long as we have the right data and the right algorithms, 
we can create predictive models that can inform us how to steer into a, a future. Um, and then a few years later, after realizing the limitations of that, in, in that first version, there were basically 11 leverage points and they go down from number 12 as the least important to number one as um, the most important. And in the first paper, she stopped with at the level of paradigm shifts, that's where we um, have the highest leverage point. And then a later version of that same paper is, is available that where, where she added another layer, which is the, the ability to transcend paradigms, the ability to not frame everything in the frame of paradigm shifts, because what, what happens when we do that, we frame things in a very dualistic kind of way. We go from this to that. And to some extent, it's in the structure of language. So to some extent, I will make, we'll be making the same mistake when I say that we need a science of qualities. I don't mean that that means leaving behind a science of quantities. It just means that the science of quantities is also only a limited perspective and we need to expand that perspective and give equal value to understanding the qualitative relationships in the system because really ultimately um, the health, wholeness, dynamism, vitality of ourselves, our communities, our bioregions and ultimately the, the, the planetary biosphere, the, the complexity we participate in is really all about qualities. Um, and qualitative relationships. And just because I was talking about Danella Meadows, I also, for those who haven't seen this, um, there's a wonderful paper that was initially published in the Whole Earth Review just after Donella died um, quite, quite early on, and like, unfortunately far too early. Um, and Th this particular paper was later turned into her latest book, which is, um, I can't actually remember the title, some, sometimes Thinking in Systems, I believe. And um, in that, she even gets more qualitative about how we dance with systems. It's, it, it really is like the, even the, the, the metaphor, it's not leverage points, it's not a mechanical metaphor anymore, it's, it's becoming a dance. She's in the system by saying it's a dance. Um, and it's about getting the beat and um, listening to the wisdom of the system, getting multiple perspective in, uh, opening mental models to uh, criticism and feedback from others so we can learn, which is what I learned that, that I should have done with, with a lot of my writing 10 years earlier. I, I kind of sat on it like an academic. Um, wow. It was in some kind of shelf, on some kind of shelf in the university. And because only when we put these ideas out can we have conversations and they're generative. And in these conversations, we all bring forth the world together as Maturana and Varela like to put it. And um, so I, I really just wanted to drop this in for, for this kind of audience, um, assuming that you're all sort of interested in systems thinking that these three papers are really worth taking another look at and particularly the Dancing with Systems one. And another, um, piece of work that in this context I, I should uh, mention is Katya Laszlo's work where she says that we really need to move beyond just systems thinking to systems feeling and systems being, um, which again says the, the, the same thing. It, it, on the one hand says we're in the system, we're not externalized observers. Um, and it begins to recognize that there are other ways of knowing that are important, that are not just the analytical analysis of data. Because um, coming back briefly to, to the crisis we're facing, like I, um, Kevin Barron, who, who I actually don't know, who just interact with him on Facebook, he, he recently put it beautifully by, by, by saying that um, we're now at a situation in, in the world where if we just look at the data, if we like, like what we're facing um, is, we, we now have to do, like what Kevin said is we now have to do the impossible because the likely is unthinkable. And I think that's a powerful way of framing where we're at. Um, if we just look at the quantitative scientific data that comes from the IPCC and, and all the trigger points in the climate system, um, 
and we just look at the data of where we're at with increased um, ideological separation in the world with with um, the strongmen coming back in in many countries um, with the the evil monster of fascism um, raising its 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 ugly head again that we thought we long um, got beyond then um, we could easily despair and say this is this isn't going anywhere so so really um, we have to almost trust that there's something deeper that is about a um, transformation of our entire being and consciousness state that because we're all part of the system and co-creators of the system if we change individually we actually in, um, affect the larger whole that, that that we're part of and if enough of us engage in that process then we might just still have a chance to to work that miracle that that we now need to work and and I love this Wendell Berry, Berry quote, applying knowledge, scientific or otherwise, is an art. An artist is somebody who knows what to put where and when to put it. And I think that's, again, that qualitative um, ability to dance with system that, that, uh, that I'm still exploring and, and, and wondering, how do I do this work uh, beyond just talking about it and, and, and intellectualizing about it? And, and so, um, again... Uh, I normally don't put slides with massive amounts of text, but for some reason, like um, this group really um, made me go back into quite an academic presentation. Um, but but I think it's 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 useful because I learned so much from Brian Goodwin, and and these phrases really carry a lot. Um, like the the top one where he basically says that. To, to really understand how health and wholeness emerges as, as, as an emergent property of these complex dynamic systems at the different levels from cellular to organ to individual to family to community to, to bioregion to planet. We, we, we need to look at the qualitative relationships and, and we need to um, approach things much more again from an aesthetic um, feeling and, and sensing and intuiting into systems and not just from an analytic um, thinking. And I, I, I see this all the time where we, where we have these long debates about masculine and feminine and, and, and then lots of women don't feel heard. And it's, um, and it's partially because we still have this strong um, cultural dogma that there's only one way of approaching really factual knowledge and it's the analytical thinking male kind of way and i'm not I mean, i don't even like polarizing it between male and female but but, but it is it's, it's also the same that comes out with indigenous cultures they they don't feel like to bring the deep knowledge of living in place of a million uh, of, of a thousands or even ten thousand years into this conversation, which would be such crucial knowledge that we had the stupidity to dismiss as primitive knowledge in, when, when we um, got excited about scientific progress and technological progress. Um, it, I think it's all to do with, with this bias of only validating one way of knowing, as, as um, Jung calls these, these four ways of knowing, intuition, feeling, sensing, and, and thinking. And um, Another person who's, I think, grappling with exactly the same kind of issues that, um, again, maybe a reminder for people to mute their mic because I hear people's telephones and coffee cups. Um, so, yeah, an another person to, to highlight in, in this context is um, Nora Bateson, who I think with, with this whole conversation that she now started and the, the, the warm data labs that she's running, the conversation around what is warm data, she's really addressing these same issues. Um, and I, I'm kind of, I can't receive my own slides because of this. Well, let me just let me figure out how I get rid of this bar because it's starting to irritate me. Um, no, that's not what I wanted to do. Um, how do I get there? Ah, okay, great. So, um, yeah, I guess the main point that I wanted to make is um, Nora is, is another um, great source of people for people who want to go deeper into this conversation around how do we 
value new forms of knowing or ancient forms of knowing and how do we value different ways of uh, being an approach being in and approaching the world and um also the minute we we don't pay that much attention to um just the intellectual analytical then we also can give more value to multiple ways of knowing and, and, and different perspectives because really the complexity we're facing is now so drastic that it's, it's impossible to have just one way of knowing um, to inform us about it. Um, I'm still stuck with this. Sorry about this. Um, <laughs> uh, 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 what's going on here? Anyway, I got, no, now my screen is stuck. Okay, no, sorry about this. What is going on? No. Basically, I have this screen where I see your faces. Um, if, you, and it, if you go back down to the share button and find what it is you want to share, it may straighten it out. Down to the share button, okay. Like, that's okay. Okay, so. Right. Um, so, yeah. Again, highlighting this this overall shift into what does it mean to radically accept participation as a notion that gives us, on the one hand, an enormous amount of responsibility because every action that we engage in does affect the the whole system and does change the world. And I think it's a wonderful example to, to, to look at this, this 16 year old um, Swedish girl, um, Greta Thunberg, as an example of that it is actually possible for one individual to make a global impact. And it starts with a seemingly um, quixotic or Don Quixote type action of, of thinking that, that by sitting in front of a parliament in, um, in Stockholm, um, this one little girl could, could start a global movement, and she did. Um, so uh, it's, it's, I think we're all called now to understand that we have to become actors in this last act of civilizational importance of the end of in the of the era of empires and the beginning of the planetary era and if, if we want to make this transition from the era of empires from the era of power over to the era of power with as um mature members of the community of life again rather than an immature species that thinks it can exploit uh, the planetary system it depends upon um, ad infinitum then we, we really need to step from this, not just from ego to ego, but really to step into service um, and, and ask this question of what would it be like to participate appropriately in the system. And really that's for me what designing regenerative cultures is all about. It's, it's about um, how do we engage with our communities in place um, to make our present, a presence as human beings in our local bioregion or on the planet, a regenerative and healing one rather than a degenerative and exploitative one. Um, and so another guidance system that, that I found very useful in um, understanding how we make mistakes when we, when we begin to think in this way that we're all co-creating this complex dynamic system we're in is work from a German systems psychologist called Dietrich Döner that was summarized in the work of Friedrich Fester in 2004. And he basically, what Döner did is he, he um, created a, a computer model that was simulating what was happening to a fictitious country. And then a tran uh, transdisciplinary team of scientists was, uh, a scientist was asked to basically run the country. And set certain lever leverage points in the system. And the, the main point of this exercise wasn't whether his computer model was perfect, 
but was to observe how these transdisciplinary teams of scientists um, from different uh, like economists and, and biologists and, and um, very, very diverse group were inter interacting and responding to the changes that they had decided. And um, so you can see that like the, these main mistakes that um, he pointed out are basically the ones that we constantly face when, when we look at uh, getting things wrong, basically. Um, we, we define the, the, the wrong goals, and we have not enough of a whole systems analysis that really understands nested holarchic systems and that doesn't pay enough attention to, to side effects. And then when we react, we oversteer and um, we, we, we try to, rather than dancing with the system, we try to force the system into, into new ways of um, doing things. And what, one thing that I also noticed in the work of my book is that these kind of lists of uh, common mistakes or principles, um, they, they very often, they stay very intellectual and very, I tell you to, if you list them in this way. So what I've ex um, explored in, in my book in quite some detail is the power of turning these principles and these, these guidelines into questions. Um, these are basically the same points that Dietrich Döner um, discovered, um, rather the last one which I added, um, but by turning them into questions, there's something powerful that happens because if I tell you a set of principles to follow, I'm basically telling you, I've done the work, believe me, I know what, what needs to be done, just follow the principles and all will be fine. But if I, turn it into a set of questions, then it becomes an engagement. Then um, it becomes an invitation to create collective intelligence because I'm actually asking the audience or asking the co-participants um, what they think about these questions. And, um, and it also means that everything becomes much more attuned to the community and the place that the question is asked in. So it becomes place specific and culture specific and for me that that is like if i if i give you a, a, a nutshell um definition of uh what designing regenerative cultures is all about for me it's about co-creating elegant solutions that are carefully adapted to the biocultural uniqueness of place and this biocultural uniqueness of place that that we can't find solutions that are global we can share best practice and best processes, we can share what works in one place, but we and, and, and then explore in a questioning way whether it might also be appropriate in another place. But we can't cut and paste sol solutions. We, and in a similar way, this, this economic knee-jerk response of how do we scale it up might be inappropriate because um, when solutions get scaled up, they often become problems rather than solutions. Um, Maybe it's about scaling out um, or, or reaching scale by spreading, meaning that these appropriate patterns of participation happen at the local or by a regional level in different ways, depending on the uniqueness of the local ecosystem and the uniqueness of the local culture. And another reflection here is, is that in the very title of designing regenerative cultures is a paradox. And it's to do with that paradox of emergence and design that, that really um, cultures, are, they, they're not designed, they emerge. They emerge through the interactions and the relationships through all those qualitative nuances that, that we tend to not pay enough attention to in, um, in a too quantity focused science analytical science. Um, but at the same time, we do need to face the future with some form of action. And so our intentions um, of how to participate and the interactions and relationships we create on the basis of these intentions really do matter. But it's this it's this dance, like for, for me, that is really the, the core of what I would like to have our conversation or questions and answers afterwards on, is this, um, how do we design for positive emergence? What, what do you do when you, on the one hand, fully embrace 
uncertainty and unpredictability and uncontrollability of the systems we're in because you 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 actually include everybody and you include the the complexity of not just trying to leverage change with the usual suspects that are already agreeing with you but you're actually trying to work at the bioregional scale with everybody in your bioregion in the context of the global situation and um so you you really have to deal with the fact that there's lots of people that see the world very differently and um for me that's an ongoing inquiry how how to do that well um and as you can see it's a blank slide which has, I didn't finish it um another set of questions that that are basically there were guidelines but i turned them into questions that that might help in this context is what um, my colleagues from the IFF, Graham Lester and Maureen O'Hara put together in a wonderful little book, which is called 10 Things to Do in a Conceptual Emergency. And, um, and again, all of these questions point towards the, the same kind of qualitative issues and the same issues that also Nora Bateson addresses with warm data, like these um, looking at processes of change in different timescales, taking the long view, um, looking at how where the intervention points are that that might flip a system with a relatively small intervention into a different state of being um and how how to work with the system when you're acknowledging that you you can't actually control it and um that to some extent all we can do is repattern the present in order to bring forth a different future together. And just to give you, because all of this is, is very abstract to some extent, um, just to, to give you an example of how I've been trying to do this in a very practical way, um, just recently, well, it's now two years ago that in my work with Guy Education, where I work um, as the head of design and innovation, helping to write curriculums and, and, and create new courses and new materials. Um, when the SDGs first came out in um, September 2015, Guy Education was already involved in the process of drafting the SDGs as part of the UN consultatory process because we're, we're part of an NGO that, that is um, advising the Economic and Social Council of the, um, of the United Nations. And so when the SDGs were finally endorsed by 198 nations in September 2015, we set about creating a course to help implement them at the local level. And um, I ended up with, with, with that task. And the idea was to just create a one-day workshop. And I really used this Buckminster Fuller quote of, if you want to teach people a new way of thinking, don't bother trying to teach them. Instead, give them a tool, the use of which will lead to a new way of thinking as my, my sort of guiding principle. And um, what I came up with is this idea of, of these SDG flashcards that um, when they were finished, I, I saw that like it was, it was really still the, the, the better version that, that um, was sent to, the, to UNESCO, our partner in, in the UN, and they really liked what they saw. And um, very quickly, bef before we even had enough time to correct the what I would call the better version, these cards were then translated into um, Spanish, French, Portuguese, Arabic, Russians, and, Ch and, and Chinese. And basically, these cards are structured in the same way that all of Gaia Education's curriculums are, are structured. And we take a four-dimensional approach to sustainability. So it's not just the classic social, economic, and ecological, but it includes worldview as an important fourth dimension. Um, you could call worldview culture, you could call worldview spirituality. It brings, diff brings up different responses in different people, but it's basically acknowledging that this second order observation of how do I think about things actually affects um, how I act in all the other dimensions and, and is therefore crucial. And so each of these, each of the 17 SDGs is approached through three cards, which the cards actually help a 
group process of living questions in place about how are the SDGs relevant to this place? What is already happening in this place that might help implement this particular SDG? And what could we do to, um, to co-create a relevant implementation project about this SDG? And then also cross-referencing to other SDGs in such a way that it guides people into a much more systemic understanding, not just by thinking of each of the 17 from four different dim dimensions, but also thinking about how, how to um, link them all up and create projects that, that implement not just one or two, but, but all 17 at once, ideally. And so these cards come together with a one-day workshop process, which is called the training of multipliers. Um, and there's a, a, there's a number of other tools that, that are used in that workshop, not just the cards. One of them is this idea that, that I just used the, the basic business model canvas that a lot of people are probably familiar with. And I just tweaked the, the questions on the canvas to um, be specific to people working on implementing a particular SDG project. And so that's the, the SDG project canvas. And then I also created a handbook, which in a very detailed way explains to people how to run this one day training of multipliers. So the idea here was not just to create a tool that makes people think differently, but also to create an analog version of a viral spread in a way. And um, to, to basically uh, anybody who's done the workshop, the one day workshop, who has a set of these cards and has a copy of the multipliers handbook, which you, which you can download for free on the Guy Education website, could potentially if they have just the basic skills of, of being a facilitator or, or, or a teacher or group leader, could run the workshop the next day in their community or in their, in their business or um, in the local town hall and, um, or in a, in a school or a university to engage real people in place around this idea of implementing the SDGs. And, and what, what I should also say is that I'm quite critical of, of some aspects of the SDG process, particularly I think that the 169 targets under the 17 goals um, is where the neoliberal lobby has um, had a lot of influence and, and has yet again created this bias because they're talking about targets and measurements. It's yet again what an example of what I talked about at the beginning of this talk, um, that we're too quant quantity focused and we miss the qualitative relationships. And, and maybe in terms of the actual goals, I would say that the, the, the goal that is sabotaging all other goals to be implemented is the way that goal number eight is currently worded as decent work and economic growth, because it's, it's not um, addressing the underlying issue that structure drives behavior in systems and a system that has an inbuilt growth imperative because of our economic system being based on a way of creating money that... Um, creates money out of nothing um, when debt is created and then has differential interest rates on loans and deposits. It therefore creates a need for econ economies to have to grow at 3% per annum or, or they collapse. And ultimately, that is a driver of degeneration and exploitation of people and planet. And if we don't address that issue, then I don't think we will ever be able to implement all the other goals. And, and so yet again, all of this is an example both of an intervention tool of how do we design for positive emergence. Like you can see that all these tools, the cards, the, the canvas, the, the book, I can't predict and control and manipulate much what these local groups of people will come up with when they have conversations using these tools. But I can create the tools that will enable them and will guide them into a more systemic way of thinking about the, the SDGs, that the very tool itself might help them to come up with ideas and, and projects that will actually result in positive emergence rather than, than more of the same. Um, so um, how are we doing for time? Because I, on the one hand, I could go on, but maybe I could also stop here and, and just ask, ask some questions and then um, we can go... Back we're like 45 minutes into it, so... Okay, I think then, then I'd ra rather than, than going on much longer, I think I'd, I'd rather open up for conversations, and if I then feel like 
picking up some more of the slides, I, I, I can do that. Let me just go here and stop sharing so I can see you all again. That's much better. So is there anybody online that wants to ask Daniel a question? Just jump in here. You just need to unmute yourself. Or reflection. Um, this was too abstract. Yeah. No, I, I think it was great. Um, you know, when you were talking about in economic growth, I was thinking about Rian Eisler's work, The Caring Economy. Um, mm -hmm. You know, she took the GDP and then added all the social indicators to that and like volunteerism and things like that, that makes strong communities and strong nations, so. Yeah, we definitely need new indicators that, I mean, GDP is, is goes up if you have a war or if you have a natural c catastrophe. Um, so uh, I, I can I can put it in the chat box or, or um, like I, in my Medium blog, there are lots of articles on alternative indicators. Okay, that would be, that would be great. Um, I, I have a comment about um, economics mm -hmm. um, and it's really helpful to hear what you have to say today, Daniel. It really, um, and my brain's going mad at the moment, <laughs> thinking about everything, but that's a system thing, isn't it? Um, so in the communities that we're going to be building um, in Bristol in England, uh, to start with anyway, um, we're using the sustainability framework of One Planet Living, but we're also going to see what we can do to put into practice Donut Economics by Kate Rayworth. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I'm in contact with her a fair bit, and I've, um, I've, I've put a slide in my presentation about our project. And so what she's aiming to do is to meet everyone's needs within the um, within the means of the planet so that will that will become our basic uh, question our overarching kind of question uh, and we can keep asking each other as we're building this community and living it are all of your needs being met um, uh, and we've got some measurables from Kate now, um, and we can keep, as, as well as having the qualitative bits, we can keep measuring that within our little micro community, we're not overshooting the boundaries. So we're going to start playing with that. And then as other communities pop up around the city and further afield, see if we can keep replicating that, um, and as you say, each community is going to be different depending on its place. But just to see how things can be tweaked and shifted, and and by asking those same basic questions um, and principles, uh, and hope, and just not paying attention to GDP at all, focusing entirely on meeting everyone's needs in our community and making sure we're not overshooting and. I'm hoping that we can prove to our mayor, Marvin Rees, who's still tied into GDP, um, uh, but I have talked to him about Kate's book. Um, I'm hoping to prove that we don't need to look at GDP at all. So we'll see how we go with that. <laughs> but what, what I would say, I mean, what, what wonderful initiative, and, and I, I love Kate's work. It's actually one of the things that I really want to do more is, is to include like bring Kate's work and work and my work closer together and, and contextualize them. Um, I mean, from a personal experience, um, I spent a long time working with the eco village movement and also with the transition town movement because I was very keen on this kind of start local, think global, act local, and all that, and and trying to create patterns as as back. Back then, in, in, in 1999, when I tried to set up an eco village in, in southern Spain, our aim was to be part of the solution rather than to be part of the problem. But what I have got to in my own learning is that we need to work at all the scales at one and the same time. Like what what like because all the models you're trying to build in and around Bristol. Um, are still sitting within this nested holarchy of systems that are actually fundamentally structurally dysfunctional and 
degenerative and, and they will affect you. And, and I mean, at Fintorn, we, we, we try to live a one planet footprint lifestyle. And, and, and just after I got there, they did a, um, ecological footprint study of, of the community and it was half the UK, but it was by no means within um, planetary boundaries. So it's not that easy um, to create a system that, that is within planetary boundaries right now. But what, what's powerful about Kate's work is, is that she reminds us not to just look at the, the, the ecological transgressions, but also the, 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 um, the, the social foundations and the economic foundations that enable people to do that. Um, and, but, I, but I guess what, I'm, what I would encourage you to do is, because once you start a community process and you really engage with it, it's, it's very easy to create a bubble around that process and, and to only focus on that. And um, I think it's important to understand these initiatives in networks with other initiatives that also happen in the wider region around Bristol and even to think of Bristol within its bioregion and to start really like, I moved to Mallorca because I wanted to be in a place where I could explore transformative innovation at the bioregional scale. How, how, do we, how do we work with community, but how do we do so in the bioregional context? Because I, I think that if we, if we are to redesign the human impact on Earth in the time available to avoid cataclysmic climate change, we have to come back to patterns that are more bioregional rather than national or only local. Um, because there, there's something about that scale of multiple communities working within a watershed to meet their needs that you can actually get the systemic uh, whole systems yeah. design in place to, to, to do what you're trying to do. Yes, and um, because we're looking at natural building and one of the sites we're looking at has a woodland right next door with lots of um, hazel coppice that we can use to start building with um, but we're also talking to people who have a license to grow hemp um, in the bioregion and starting to talk with them uh, if we could start to create some kind of resource um, and local economy where where we get our the materials we need to build the houses in the city in the bioregion, grow them locally, and encourage local landowners to do that. Um, I mean that yeah. that for me that that um, when I say the redesign is bioregional, I think it's also about creating um, circular economies at the bioregional scale that don't make the mistake that the Alan MacArthur Foundation tends to make when they talk about the two cycles of the, the, the industrial metabolism and the biological metabolism, and they talk about it as if the industrial metabolism cycle could go on forever. Um, but that, the, the, and then they use this fancy word upcycling, um, and, and, and basically it's physically and, and, and chemically impossible and energetically impossible to upcycle these kind of um, elements continuously forever. They, what, what we really need to do is to, over the next 100, 150, 200 years, contract that industrial metabolism and, and grow the biological metabolism. And in doing so, that's the, the, the process of climate change reversal because we, we, we bring carbon back into the soil, we bring carbon back into standing forests, we bring carbon back into the biomaterials, the houses, the, everything we use. And in, in doing so, we, we not only build these regeneratively grown biomaterials and, and local or regional food economies, which will get, give people jobs and work on the social foundations in terms of Kate's work. Um, but we, we also um, basically create a response to climate change. And, and so I think that's the, the, it's vital work, but it's um, in its infancy. We still have to, a lot of work to do. Maybe, maybe we just take a few questions and then I answer them rather than... Um, is, is, is there anybody else who wants to ask a question or comment? Sure, I'd love to jump in there. Uh, Daniel, it's Mark Rollins here, actually. It's my wife that's names up there. Um, uh, loving your conversation. It's fantastic. 
uh, area that my wife and I are focused on right now is uh, basically trying to energize the movement within people and outside of orga with organizations and governance. So looking at the schedule, if you will, and being an engineer, I tend to be very pragmatic. Looking at the tightness of the schedule, I know you've mentioned that's a, that's a very hopeful schedule of 12 years to make a difference. Uh, and we're going to have to weather some serious storms that we have to get moving as fast as possible. So I'm, I'm myself looking at systems of uh, governance and how we can actually affect the changes and movements within our governments that are very caught in their own paradigms at the moment, still very much here in Vancouver, Canada, very much a capitalistic paradigm. And everything stems from that. So the... Uh, trying to build hope in the message, joy in the messaging, that we have this incredible opportunity in the, 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 the human civilization where we have a lever or a huge catalyst here for potential global change towards the vision that includes much of which is the, the global goals. And the block being the lack of trust and those borders in the sand, and they're not bio, bio regions. They're actually countries that are... Uh, with, with lines and limits based on cultures and that are blocking much of this. And a lot of the power and control still remains there. And so, you know, when you're seeing some of these incredible movements, I'm getting to my question, some of these incredible movements with, uh, with Systems Think and Kit Capra, with uh, Theory U, and there's just so many more, is how to pull these together into a real force where we can start to move towards these political systems and start to, I guess, encourage the politicians to start seeing the world and from a different paradigm to create that very fast change. Do you think, do you think that's possible to do that, to get that kind of movement? And if not, then how do we move fast enough? <laughs> that's the <laughs> big question, isn't it? <laughs> um, <laughs> do we want to take a couple more questions or shall I answer this one first? What, what do people... Go ahead, go ahead and take. Okay, well, um, yes, <laughs> where do I start on that one? Um, in, in, in other parts of my, my writing, if you, if you go onto my Medium blog and you just put in my name and Medium and then um, Three Horizons, You'll, you'll get a number of links to this three horizon model that, that is, is quite useful to um, start thinking about these big transitions that we need to make. And um, the reason why I bring this up is because the, the conventional sort of na nation state, um, what is called horizon one in this system um, that, that you're addressing as being still stuck in the old paradigm. Um, one way of ch shifting it is, is to really pay more attention to what's already growing, some of the, the, the movements you've, you've mentioned. Um, there's, there's a talk that I gave at Finthorn that you, you can find on the internet on human and planetary health, where I list a lot of these movements around the planet, um, ecosystems, restoration camps, the capital institutes, um, uh, regenerative communities network, and, and their um, focus sites for of where people around the world have, have already committed to creating um, bioregional regenerative economies um, and, and trying to create whole systems prototypes at that scale. Um, and I think that we need to combine all that work rather than get too hung up in arguing against each other about whether it has to be regenerative or flourishing or thriving or all these different words that we like to use to, to recognize that we're all part of these regenerative cultures emerging. As, as Paul Hawkins so beautifully put it, it's the planet's immune response to the crisis that is speaking through us as planet um, doing all this work and, and to, to um, really cherish the, the diversity and the, the plurality of approaches, um, almost like to, to see which one works. And we, because another thing to keep in mind is that as we communicate about this to people, there is no one language that will reach people equally. Like if you, you look at the spiral dynamics or, or the, 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 the integral model, um, people are at different stages of, of personal development. 
and they will they will be triggered by certain words like if I talk to you about um, shared decision making and, and and participatory governance you, you will resonate if I say that to somebody who's in a different mindset they will consider it as as something um, challenging um, so that there's a wonderful article by Barrett Brown called communicating sustainability that he wrote in 2009 in, in Cosmos Journal and it, it's a great example of of how we need to message our message in different ways to different people and it's not selling out like um, it's it's um, just being skillful about where you how do you begin you mentioned trust how do you begin to build trust by not alienating people from the start and coming in with the a vision that they're not able to swallow yet um, but to to take people pick them up where they're at and in, in many ways I think that the SDGs are a platform that allow us that because they're, they're, they're systemic enough to address quite a lot of the issues we do need to address um, but they're, they're relatively conventional platform that was built on a multi-sector multi-stakeholder process and and then just briefly to how do we get to scale I'm, I'm constantly grappling with that um, question and, and more and more I'm, I'm realizing that I've been talking in my own echo chamber that the people that I've got on the different Facebook groups and in my Twitter feed and, and, and so on, or the people that I meet at conferences, we're, we're all in, in the same echo chamber um, and we're talking to each other about this. And, and yes, the echo chamber is growing, what, what, what I like to call the regeneration rising. It's, it's becoming a bigger and bigger echo chamber. But um, what I think we really need to engage is all the cultural creative mechanisms. I think we need to engage the musicians, the, the theater, plays, artists, um, fine art, uh, on, on all scales, the, the big names and the small neighborhood busker to, to, to basically bring this way of thinking and this way of seeing into the public and cultural discourse in as diverse a way as possible. And, and I'm, I'm beginning to work with a foundation on on these issues, like how do, how do we create a traveling exhibition on bio, uh, biomimicry or on, 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 on regenerative development and regenerative design um, in a way that engages some of the big names in the art industry and through them then brings people into this conversation that, that might just come because each one of the exhibits also has a painting by a famous artist. Um, but then they engage with the material of the exhibit in a de deeper way and, and, and you begin to build bridges to, to those other um, constituencies. And similar way, um, in, on the 10th of May, I'm hoping to meet a, a very famous, uh, well, I might as well mention his name, Lenny, Lenny Kravitz. Some, somebody is trying to put me together with Lenny Kravitz to, to have a conversation how his work, which is already, I don't know if you listen to some of the lyrics from his latest album, Raising Vibrations. Um, I hadn't listened to some of his stuff for probably a decade, but, but when I tuned into that album, I realized that, that um, it speaks the same language as the regeneration rising. It, it speaks a language of, um, one, one song for example is called it, It's Enough, and another one is called Here to Love. And, and they really um, do acupuncture with the social system and address these issues and, and I think once we we engage the music industry and, and reach two or three billion people on the planet at a very shallow level, if that's the funnel that then brings only four or five percent of them to the next level and then one percent of those to a deeper level, we will already have a much different situation as we have now. We, we will have um, created critical mass. So so that's, that's why I'm um, putting my my work towards at the moment. That's it. That's exciting, Daniel. Thank you. And yeah. I think you brought up an important thing or described an important aspect of getting our beliefs out because we, we're very passionate about this and we know that we need to do this, but we have to find the right language and the right avenues and the right everything to actually interact with people who don't quite get it. Yeah. Um, and and that's a, that is a tap dance at times to try to figure out what is the right language. Absolutely. And I, and, and I find it's 
people can also fall into the trap of saying, oh, I can't mention this to my client or I can't mention this to the head of the city planning board because they'll think I'm strange. Yeah? I, I always find if, if, we fi if, you find the right, if you find the right language and the right entry points and you build trust on a couple of issues, um, it is okay to then say, naming that the larger vision is a longer term vision and might not be for tomorrow or the day after tomorrow, but, but it is important to also push the boundaries and name these real transformative changes. Um, like, like I, I think people have responded quite well to some of the, the memes I've been putting out, which are these kind of audacious statements like redesigning the human impact on earth. That's massive. Yeah. Um, but I, I think that's ultimately what we're, we're challenged to, to do, but we're not going to do it at a global scale um, from the start. It's, it's this idea that um, you might have heard this word glocal, this putting to word, together the word global and local. And I, I think that the transformative action that is needed now is global action. It is um, working one at the same time locally, bioregionally, and globally, and particularly like while the regenerative solutions are adapted to the biocultural uniqueness of place and region, the enabling factor is the global collaboration and knowledge exchange. And I, I'd love to hear Johnny's take on, like, because he's preparing this wonderful conference in, in Malaga coming up very soon on social innovation. And, and how, how does this all connect to, to what you're going to be talking about in, at Messi? Well, the first thing I would like to say is that I started in a project 20 years ago that was called Glocal Ecosystems. Uh, so Glocal, it sounds very, very connected to me. And it's a term that I've been using and in the, well, my methodology that I'm sharing for these 20 years is based on the concept that we have to go to separate the global bits, like the, the material world has to go global, but the material world has to go local so it's, it's local it's local atoms and global bits so so it has to we have to differentiate these two aspects of uh, the economy and the reality what things are in material what what needs we have that are in material and in the eco village movement from from where i come from where i, I live in an eco village and i'm part of the eco village movement and i'm head of economy in, in the eco village uh, movement in in Spain, uh, we we believe that we have to solve our our needs in our in material needs in a completely different way as we solve the material needs. So we have to go out of this materialism and and focus in the, in a more uh, in different ways of solving the, the economy. So in Nessi, and that was the question I wanted to 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 pose you is is we are planning to to create a vision of the 2030. 2030 have a, like a, a good vision that people can be inspired to go because we are talking about a lot of catastrophic situation that we have uh, right now. But I think people need hope. People need to see a place where we can go. And that's exactly what we are going to do in Nessie. We are going to try to, to create like an environment where people can live what the, the world could be in 2030 in these six uh, uh, strands that we divided in Asia, food and energy and housing and uh, finance and all these different strands. And uh, we're going to try to work to, to, sh to create the, the, uh, a design, create a plan to, to go there. But for me, what I would like to hear from you is how do you see uh, a realistic but ideal future in 2030? With this, with this uh, way of thinking, which I completely share. Mm. Um, um, well, I, I heard from Thomas Lara that that you were at Nessi trying to work with the Three Horizons framework that I mentioned earlier. Yeah. To to, yeah, to play exactly. with it. and and part of the strength of this Three Horizons framework is that none of the Three Horizons disappear. So you, you have the old system that also the red line still exists on, on the far end of where, where the, the third horizon has become dominant. And, and that's a key message that we need to also ask what is valuable about the current system that we actually still want to have in 2030 or 2050. I, I would almost 
suggest to push this time horizon out a little further, like 2045, because 2030 is very close to, for, for some real transformative changes to have happened by then. And, and while I completely understand that in order to manage a large group of 600 or 700 people in different parallel streams, you need to create these theme, themes, but, but that's to some extent part of the, the old way of thinking to go food, economy, housing, transport, um, because somehow they're also all related. So if for, for process sake, to manage the people, you, you want to start off with that theme, um, find processes that also engage people to say, okay, what are the, what are the common grounds and what are the intersection points between these things? How does transport relate to economy? How does um, housing relate to um, climate um, or whatever the, the, the themes are? I can't remember the, the, the ones you, you mentioned. But, but basically find a place to, to reintegrate that false separation that, that, that you created by keeping it in, in the thematics. And um, the other thing that I find really powerful about the Three Horizon framework is that when you've done that long journey of, okay, you've got the red horizon, one is dips down and, and, and becomes less prevalent. You have the green horizon um, three becoming more prevalent. And then you use the bridge, which is really the social innovation and, and, and innovation bridge of the second horizon to avoid collapse and rebuild and actually use that bridge to get into a, a future without the trauma that would come with a collapse. Um, it's, a, it's a powerful model partially because when you get to the top of the green hill of the third horizon being prevalent and you look down at what you're standing on, you're standing on red ground. Um, like you, you, you're the new horizon one. And, and that I think is, is, is a powerful, so I'm not gonna answer you, you the, the question of where do, do I, uh, where do I think we're going to be in 2030? Um, because I think we're still going to be on that journey and it's a journey that will never end. The journey of creating regenerative cultures is, is a, because of this dynamic understanding of process and of our strange embeddedness in this process, the, the, what you were saying, that, that the inner and the outer, the material and, 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 and the information are linked and they inform each other. They bring forth each other. Um, therefore, this process of inquiry will will go on forever, um, and all we can do is is to try to build the capacity of people in place to keep responding to changes at the local, regional, and global scale in ways that increases the viability and, and regenerative capacity of of the system overall, um, and and so really to because also in response to the other question earlier like we even if we get it right in my my opinion even if we get it right and we do get to scale or like there's enough of a demand like let's say fridays for futures and parents for 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 futures get together and and build the political demand that political leaders start responding and business starts responding yeah um we're facing this bizarre situation that like 2021 to 2030 is the, eco the UN decade for ecosystems restoration. Um, let's say we really put our effort behind it and we, we, we pair this idea with a climate change reversal response. And we pair this idea with donut economics and we say we want to create the social foundations and live within planetary boundaries. Even if we did all that as humanity, if for some reason we coordinated our um, human family in that way, we still have to be honest about the fact that it will be a lot of hard work and in the next 10, 15 years, things might still get worse, even if in the next one or two years we all decide to make the right decisions and we all start working on it full, full power. And, and I think for our movement, for the people that are going to be get, gathered at Nessie, it's really important to be clear that 
because otherwise what we're going to get is this initial, oh, wow, the regeneration is rising and we're all doing it. And then after three, four, five years, things are still getting worse in terms of climate change effects and, and um, global floods and, and, and catastrophes. And then people are saying, it's not working. <laughs> yeah? The reality is that there's a feedback, like there's a delay in the system that is why we took so bloody long to respond. 50 years we've been knowing about that we needed to respond to this, and we're only just about getting ready for it. Eh? You said Glocal, 20 years ago you started the system. Yeah? Uh, like, um, we, we need to be honest that the next thir three decades, I think, are going to be a really rough ride, and, and we will see a lot of collapse, and we s will see a lot of breakdown, and we need to celebrate that collapse and that breakdown as the dissolution of systems patterns and system structures that no longer serve and, and not be fearful of the loss of terra firma and, and, and institutions crumbling. But we also need to be really, really clear that, that even if we get it right, it's, we're in it for the long haul and, and we never really, neither, there is no destination sustainability and there is no destination regenerative culture that is perfect and that we, once we're there, we can down tools and live for happy, uh, live happily ever after. It's it's a continuous journey. Sorry to disappoint. <laughs> no, it's totally fine. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. I agree with everything you said. I think it's very smart to, to prepare for for some things that are not going to work so straightforward and so so fast. So yeah, yeah, it's important to have that in mind. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Um, Diane, you, you you're keeping time. How how we're doing? Um, we're doing good. It's um, about 15 after, so you got about 15 minutes. Great. Anybody else? Comments? Yes. Yeah. Here, Daniel. Hi. Oh, first, uh, sorry, sorry about my English, but uh, I will I will try to do my best here. <laughs> well. All right. Uh, uh, first, first, I have to thank you, Daniel, because you been an inspiration of my my journey as a systems thinker and, and practitioner as well so uh, I'm, I'm basically a, a person that is facing a transition from the from the the story of separation to the story of integration and therefore uh, kind of grasping uh, uh, how we are participants of, of, of this uh, creative power of, of the universe. So, and in this way, I, 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 I was, you know, I, I was working in business as usual as a marketer about 50, 50 years, and I started to, to identificate some disconnects between the being the same and the doing of, of business organizations. So I, start, uh, uh, I started uh, about six, six years ago, a uh, social endeavor, I call it um, JSS Interactive, is a systemic consultancy that we are aiming to, to develop uh, human organizations as a reflexive, conversational, and interdependent living systems. So in this way, we are working in what we call it the eco bio psychosocial capital, el capital eco bio psychosocial. Mm -hmm. uh, um, and you have been really helpful uh, in, in, in giving shape of, of this view that is just starting, it's just emerging. And it will, it, I just want to say it will be great to, to, be, to be in touch. Uh, with you and, and keep on working on this on this view um, and that's all that's uh, more than a question is uh, mm -hmm. I'm really grateful well, for having this opportunity of conversing with this collective mind um, we are we certainly need to keep uh, reinforcing this this view and uh, I, I totally agree. I am really convinced that we need to start for the beginning and education is, uh, it's important. It's important how we can change, we, how we can cultivate 
new seeds of education because education is the basis of all this change. Uh, we cannot do anything if we don't intervene uh, education. And that's my, my main uh, uh, preoccupation. I, I, thank you. I, thank you for, for, for the feedback because it's always like sometimes one wonders why I spend long nights putting stuff stuff up on Medium or, or posting things and, and so it's it's always deeply appreciated to get feedback like this that that it actually was meaningful to somebody. Um, and I I I would agree that education is is crucial in all of this because like as I that definition of design human intentionality expressed through interactions and relationships. Um, so the, the most upstream intervention that we can make is to change intentionality because then, so change the why we design because then the how and the what we design changes immediately once we change the why. And, and that why change happens through some form of education. But education has unfortunately very often been misunderstood as something that you do in the first third of your life and then you just uh, work and then you retire. And, um, and I think that the, one of the, the, the great mentors of, of regenerative development in, in the Regenesis group, um, one of the key principles of regenerative development is local, local or regional capacity building, like building the capacity of people to, to live this dynamic process of adapting. And, and so really education is a lifelong learning process that, that um, needs to be at the core of what regenerative cultures are really all about. And um, that, that's why, like, when, when I first started writing my book, it, it was actually the, the working title I, I started the book under was called Living the Questions Together. Um, this importance of, of, of questions and the importance of engaging with other people around questions because um, th that very process is the process of building the capacity of people to respond to change in a way that is meaningful to their culture and that is appropriate to the ecosystem that they, they live in. Um, so, so, so in, again, the, the, the regenerative development um, work of the Regenesis Group and of Kara Sanford, they speak of three levels of work in working regeneratively and the first level is personal development the the individual like it starts with the individual and in our own work on ourselves and our capacity to communicate and our capacity to learn and be think systemically think in patterns um, all of that um, so that's the work of the designer him or herself then the next level of work is is the design process and which i would say is that engaging with others in this process of living the question this dynamic um not trying to find the solutions and the answers but to actually live the questions more deeply it's this wonderful quote that i start my book with by uh, rainer maria rilke where he writes in a, in a letter to a young poet you must live the questions more deeply because you might not be able to understand the answers yet. And only if you live the questions, then maybe one fine day will you live into the answers. And, and, and for me, so, so that's the second level of work, this process of inquiry of how do we redesign the human presence on earth, but how do we do it in this place, out of this place, in the context of its culture and its history? And then the, 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 the third level of work is what you design. Um, so so the, the processes and structures and, and, and systems you put into place. And if, if they are designed regeneratively um, by people who work on the first and the second level, then they should really increase the value and the health and vitality of the systems that they're touching. And, and that's where I, I, I also see that my, my previous work in my PhD and, and the work of the regenesis group and regenerative development is very aligned because like I, I work with this notion of um, salutogenic or health generating design. And really when they say increasing the value or health of the system, to me that that's very much the same um, issue. Like if, if we only asked ourselves one question with everything we do in this kind of seventh generation type way, um, 
Does it increase the health, wholeness, and vitality of the local, the regional, and the global system? That's a powerful question to keep asking about all decisions. And, and if for some reason we feel it doesn't, then it might not be appropriate participation. Okay, is, is there time for one more? Or we're probably... We have five okay. minutes left. Is there some parting words you want to give us or... Um... Um, well, I'm, I'm just always in, encouraged that people actually make the time to engage with the conversation like this. Um, another part of me is kind of going, oh, there's seven people that dropped out. Maybe they didn't like what we talked about, but that's um, just to show that the, the I person... All, I think they all had another uh, engagement, and but they want the recording. Yeah. No, no, I'm, I, I'm trying not to take it personal, no, um, no, but, it, but just, just to make transparent that the, 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 the personal development process is ongoing as well. Like I, um, I um, still kind of go, oh, maybe I was too heady and all these, these things that don't really serve us to be like, one has to be self-critical, but not self um, sabotaging. Um, and yeah, so, so thank you all just for for caring, for, for living into these questions and um, for doing it in, in your community in whatever way um, you're doing your work because it is all of us that are going to make the difference. Um, that's what I'm absolutely convinced by. And, um, and that gives me a lot of hope because it also means that we can be more gentle with ourselves when we need to just take care of our own needs and 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 energies sometimes because i i like the, the problem with with activists and 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 trying to work for a better world is that it's it's easy to lose oneself in burning out over that work and and i always remember that like when i trained in the way of counsel and and one of the core principles of the way of counsel is that you always have to ask the, the question which is actually a deep indigenous wisdom ask the question with anything you do, does it serve myself? Does it serve my community? And does it serve life or does it serve the planet? And as activists, we find it really easy to ask the question, does it serve my community and does it serve the planet? But it's not so easy to ask the question, does it serve myself? And in this new way that I was kind of exploring in the beginning, if, if everything is interconnected and we're dealing with this interbeing state, this fundamentally dynamic wholeness transforming, then the only way that we can, in a meaningful and continuous way, serve the health of the whole to come forth is if we pay attention to our own health. And if there's nothing wrong with asking, does it serve myself? Because if you don't serve yourself, you're not going to serve the community and the planet for very long. Um, and so that's, for me, maybe a, a parting um, gift or, or advice that I also still have to um, remind myself of on a, on a regular basis. Um, and, and, and when you look into the screen and you see that there, there are 16 people on the screen that, that cared enough about this issue to make time for it, then, then you can also take the time out to recharge and rest because you know that there's other people doing good work elsewhere and that it's not you alone that has to do it all. So, um, yeah. I, I think I'll leave it at that. Thank you. You know, it's six people that are vast in in geographic areas. Like we're all over the world too. So that network is just really dynamic. So I just I want to thank everybody for joining in today too. And and Daniel, thank you for um, taking time to do this. It's been awesome. It's been an awesome presentation and awesome discussion. Pleasure. And, and I, I can share the, the PDF. I don't know if you have people's emails or something. I, do. I have everybody's email and I'll be, I'll send out the chat to everybody for sure. And a, a link to the recording. So I'll, I'll send you a PDF of the, okay. the presentation and then you can share it with people. That'll be awesome. Great. Thank you. Okay. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye. Good luck, Johnny with Nessie. Shame I can't be there. Yeah. And Johnny, thanks for all the links. Yeah. Bye bye. Yeah, you have many many links to check. Yeah. yeah thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye bye.